The Why Me Project, an exclusive presentation of Faith Strong Today. So we kick off the year of 2024 with Amy Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And she tells us about her life and we talk music and everything else. And in the midst of that, Holly, she says, uh, Soap Project, you need to talk to Teresa. Yeah. And we said, of course we do, because she sounds phenomenal and we need to dig into her life her times, <laughs> her faith, her yeah. why me moment, but it's also National Human Trafficking Awareness Month. So yeah. as we kind of round out the month of January, let's dive into this very tough conversation. As long as Teresa says, yes, we do this. If she yes. says, no, we want nothing to do with you, then <laughs> it's where we are. So she's an educator, an advocate, a survivor, a writer, an award winner, an El Presidente. And yes. there's probably other things, Teresa, that I am uh, messing up. Teresa Flores, how are you? Oh, fantastic. Thanks so much. Is there anything was you I, don't do? Yeah. Was there something that I was missing? <laughs> I don't do golf. I do not play golf. I, I can drive a mean golf cart. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, we like to ask this skill testing question because we never know where it's going to go. And that is, Teresa, who are you and where did you come from? Um, I am so many things, right? Um, you know, I'm a mom, I'm a grandma, um, I'm a survivor, and um, I'm just really passionate about ending human trafficking, I guess, bottom line. Um, mm. I was raised in the Midwest, uh, United States, so um, I currently live in Columbus, Ohio, uh, but I've been I've been all around, you know, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, even Connecticut. So why all the moving? Why going to different states? So my dad was a big executive, and he would get promoted and transferred every two years. So, um, and then when I was married to my first husband, he was in the automotive industry as an engineer. So mm. yeah, just all my life um, have had this amazing journey uh, that includes meeting so many cool people. The moving around a lot when you're young can either be a blessing or not so much. It can be hard no. to connect and form deep relationships. For you, yeah. was it was it ever daunting, like, ugh, to make a new friend again? Yeah, when you're younger, it's a lot of fun, right? <clears throat> you know, meeting new people and exploring. My mom would, would take us for drives and be like, let's go get lost. And, you know, just to find out where we were. And even now, if I live in a new city, I'm like, let's just drive and figure it out. Um, but... Um, as I got older, it was definitely daunting. Um, <clears throat> it was hard adjusting. It was always trying to fit in and wanting to be liked. Um, but it did make me, I think, a very adaptable adult. Um, so, uh, you know, you could throw me into anything and I could, and I could, um, definitely survive. Yeah. It definitely shapes you because you are constantly trying to figure out who you are and then how do you fit in this new environment? Um, is there is there like a pivotal moment that you could think of growing up that you're like it, uh, a time that would shape you to who you are now? Well, definitely being trafficked for sure, you know, mm. and and even though there were so many years in between that I didn't know that was going to happen, but it was God's work in progress. Mm -hmm. Now, were you raised in the church, as they say? Yeah. So my mom <clears throat> was Catholic. And so we were raised going to church every Sunday, going to our education, you know, um, Sunday school type things every week. My dad was um, Presbyterian um, growing up. So he wasn't super involved with us. Um, it laid a lot in my mom's lap for us to go to church. Um, but they did when he was in town and stuff, they did try to do that together. Mm hmm. So to dive into it, I guess, because you had said being trafficked for those who don't know your story, for those who yeah. don't know anything about who Teresa is, the first time that they've ever heard of you, are you able to go back to that time in which it then, I guess, all unfolded and started to this new trajectory of where you are now? Back up a little bit. I was I was a medical social worker for many, many years and I was asked by a, a coworker who was just this amazing Christian warrior woman. And she said, you know, I've been, um, I've been asked to go to this conference. I signed up for it. The company paid for it, but I can't go. And she said, and something is telling me that you need to be here. And mm. she didn't know anything about my past. And, um, I looked at it and it was about human trafficking. I thought, oh, this would be interesting. I don't know anything about it. Um, I, <laughs> this is how God is works, right? Um, I, 
Um, I thought maybe this would be great to learn from my clients in case, you know, I ever come across this. Um, and as I'm sitting in that um, audience within five minutes, I knew why I was supposed to be there. And mm. that started my whole journey. And it was interesting because, you know, all these things can happen just in a flash. And I was looking back at my life as I'm sitting there crying, you know, and Aww. I was like, wow, God prepared me perfectly for this. Like, you know, becoming a social worker, um, you know, going to college, having a strong family foundation. And I was like, he's prepared me to totally uproot me and do what this calling is. And I'd always been waiting because I knew I had a calling. Like, I know I thought, oh, it's to be a mom. And I was like, well, that's great and everything, but that's not it. Um, it's to be a wife. I was like, that's not it. And being a social worker, great, but not it. And so at that very moment, I was like, this is it. Um, and so that's kind of how the, my whole, this whole path started, um, in 2006. So, um, so just to explain kind of what got me there. Yeah. It, um, like was it a realization that you had been trafficked when you were at that conference or was? Yeah. I had never known that word to wow. mean like an American girl or, you know what I mean? Like I had never, known that that happens to Americans, especially like upper middle class, you know, um, never entered my radar. Always thought it was some other country. Yeah. Now there are different forms of trafficking. You you think of um, Liam Neeson's movie, but there is, there's definitely a lot of different forms of it. So for you, it, was it that or like, I mean, not knowing anything about it, I'm t- trying, I'm trying right. to go through this in the most sensitive way that I can. Oh, yes. You're doing great. You're doing great. Yeah. So a lot of people think of take the movie taken, you know, where this, you know, um, upper middle-class white girl has gone to another country and then kidnapped. Right. right. Yes. Um, and so kidnapping is actually only 3% of the, um, how somebody gets trafficked. So it's really mm-hmm. the minority um, it's usually somebody, you know, and, and that's exactly how it happened to me. Um, and so even like that new movie that came out, Sound of Freedom, right? Oh. You know, they're talking about little kids in other countries. So there's still very little awareness that this is happening to, to kids like me and even kids that live at home while it's happening. You know, mm. we know that almost half of trafficking is actually occurring because of a family member. While they're living at home, which is really, really tough. Um, for me, I just, I met a boy. It was, we moved to a new place. So again, here I am, you know, now a teenager, the outsider, just wanting to fit in and met a cute boy. And he was a lot different than the boys that I had typically, typically like, you know, had crushes on or hung out with. And, um, my parents were very strict. So I was not allowed to date. Uh, until I was 16 and um, six months, he was just super nice and sweet and walked me to class and, you know, what every girl likes. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so I got a crush on him, um, but my friends did not like the group of people he was associated with. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, my dad was very strict. So um, it just started off simply by liking a guy. Hmm. So was he then the gateway into trafficking? Yeah. Um, so six months go by, which we call this grooming, right? Yeah. Um, and so what I like to tell people is that grooming is courting, you know, our old word courting, but with a malintent, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, one day after school, he just asked me if I wanted to ride home from school and it was that simple. You know, here I am thinking, oh, this is great. It's this cute guy. Um, I, um, that is not a date, right? He's just taking me home from school. Uh, and he, um, and so I accepted. I was like, yep, this is great. I get five minutes in the car with him just to, you know, this is super. But he didn't take me home, unfortunately. He ended up taking me to his house, convincing me to go inside. Um, even after I had said no, you know, I mean, I was a good girl. Like I was not promiscuous. I didn't do drugs. Like I was a good girl, but I was vulnerable. I was vulnerable because I didn't know anybody because I was new because I didn't have a lot of support system. I mean, my church was my support system back then because no matter where I lived, my church was always like God was always there for me, Mm -hmm. but I didn't have a strong family support system because we moved around and they saw that and they used that against me. 
six mm. months and they knew all of that about you. Yeah, they knew they, they ended up um, drugging me and then taking photos, which is very common today, even, yeah. you know, 30 years later, they knew where my dad worked, like the, uh, the address of his office, the name of his boss. Um, all of that. So they, they did their homework. These guys are very good at what they do. Wow. Two years, you know, I ended up going to school during the day where several of them in this group were in school with me. So watching me, and then I would go home in the afternoon and in the evening they would call like around midnight and I would have to sneak out and meet them. And they would just take me all over the Detroit area to do whatever they wanted. How does someone get out of that? Usually you don't. I mean, I just, well, that's what I mean. Like well, it's yeah. all the stories that you hear and it's like, yeah, how do you, cause I mean, you are where you are now. Mm-hmm. Something, you know, was there some, really through, you know, the grace of God, right? Like, yeah. um, because most either die in it, no. um, either by suicide overdose or the pimp or the, which is the trafficker. Or the John, which is the buyer, murdering them. It's a very, very violent. So, um, I, I do believe that, you know, I was, that I was saved from that, um, be, to do what I do now. You know, mm. I really believe that. Um, I did not go on, get on drugs, which a lot of them do because the traffickers force them into that so they can control them. So that really is a game changer. If you, you know, if you're getting stuck on drugs, then too, it, it really changes things. But my dad ended up getting um, transferred again and it was a thousand miles away. Um, so mm. God made sure that I was far, far away and safe. Um, and um, I was able to just really escape. Wow. Sorry. How old were you when it started? 15. 15. And yeah, so 15 and a half, almost 16. Years. Then I was 17 uh, when it stopped. So I was a sophomore in high school till I, till my end of my junior year. Yeah. So you move, like, what, where, what is your head at? Because you're now going to a new school. Uh, you, how are your, is your back against the wall now every time you think that everybody that you talk to is going to be like, just like these, these jerks? No, actually, that's a great, nobody's ever asked me that question. That's really great. Um, my head was at the fact that I just wanted to assume my old identity. I just mm-hmm. wanted to be the old Teresa again, the innocent, you know, sweet girl that was still a virgin. So that was a story that I told was that, you know, I'm a good girl. I'm a virgin. And, um, I had a boyfriend, but we were, um, it was nothing like, you know, physical happened between us. And, um, had, was in band and had, you know, some, a good group of friends and then went off to college. So I kind of buried it away, you know, cause I didn't know how to handle it. Yeah. Yeah. And which, which makes sense. So then you bury it. Why then may, or when did you decide to make it public? Because uh, if, if you're hiding this and I mean, nobody has to know, I mean, this is, this is, right. this is old you, you know, yeah. let's, let's focus on new you. But you, you know, you can't do that successfully for very long, like little pieces and things seep through. Um, And so in college, it was very difficult. Um, A lot of PTSD that was coming out from it. Um, Tried to tell somebody, I went to the rape crisis center there um, and just began to tell my story. And they were like, nope, nope, nope. Like, you know, don't know how to handle you. And so turned away. Um, And then two more years later, um, went to a counselor again at uh, my university and they were like, you know, we just, we don't know anything about this kind of stuff. And, and again, had no words of human trafficking. Th- those words didn't, you know, even exist then. Um, so just, you know, buried it away. Um, really just, uh, surviving, just surviving. Ended up getting married. Um, but it was a very abusive relationship, which is very typical because I didn't have that great sense of worth. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. and it took until I went to that, um, that conference before I really started to tell people. Yeah. You actually held on to it that long. Many years. Yeah. Yeah. Did your parents notice anything off with you during those two years? Yeah. Um, they did send me to counseling, which I didn't open my mouth during that time. I mean, the threats were too big. Like these guys threatened to kill my family they followed me everywhere, would come into my part-time job and just stand there. Um, so the threats were very high. So I did not say a word. Um, and then again, like 
teachers, doctors, them, you know, it's kind of like, well, she's just having a hard time adjusting to the new school. Yeah. Teenage hormones, you know, that's why she's sick, you know, or, you know, just those kind of, they just kind of brush it off, which is really typical for parents to do, you know? So even yeah. teachers, they're like, how come she was getting A's and B's and now she's getting F's? So they're like, well, maybe it's just, she's not used to this. So, and I wasn't saying anything. There, there was no way I could say anything. I asked just because I have two daughters. Johnny mm-hmm. has a daughter. Mm-hmm. And I think as parents, we don't want to be hyper vigilant in the sense that we're overprotective and not allowing them to live their life. But at the same time, it's we want to keep our, our girls safe. And we know how prevalent it is across North America as the news continues to come out about these massive um, tr- human trafficking rings. We, yeah. you know, just recently this month, the uh, Jeffrey Epstein list was released and it's just like oh my goodness like how do all these people know or are a part of these very intricate and dangerous rings yeah it's very much a big network yeah Yeah. even when it's parents or grandparents or step you know family doing it it's still a part of a very big network yeah i would also preface this holly just i mean i do have a son too and i mean oh yes that's true you know that's true I yes, mean, we absolutely. do think, we do think mostly girls for sure. Yeah. That's it. And well, I mean, like I, cause I was been, you know, speaking out and doing this work and I had two teenage daughters and a younger son. And I thought, well, thank goodness this would just never happen to my son. And then I thought, oh my gosh, Teresa, you're being a fool. Like yeah. if somebody, and I must says I was a single mom, um, working all the time, traveling. And I thought if somebody came to him and he's 12 and they say, we know where your sisters are. We know where your mom's at. You better do this. Absolutely, he would do it. Absolutely, yeah. he would do anything to protect us. And mm-hmm. so I'm thinking, wow, we we need to bring boys into this conversation as well. Then how does I mean, if we I'm let's just fast forward. How do we come to then the soap project? At, at yeah. what point then? If, if you go to this conference, you right. have this revelation, mm-hmm. but now you want to do something. You want to be an advocate. You want to start. How did that come about? Well, I had done a lot of healing in between. So, um, you know, trying to find a counselor, which that never worked. Um, but I think I've read every self-help book in Barnes and Noble. Um, you know, got some to some great small groups and really leaned on my faith. I journaled a lot. So I felt like I was in a good spot emotionally as much as I could be uh, that, you know, and so, um, fell upon this and, learned that there was no law against human trafficking in Ohio where I lived. Um, And most states didn't have, you know, any protections around it. And I thought, this is crazy. Like my kids are the same age. My daughter, oldest daughter is the same age as what I was when I was trafficked. Um, We have to do something about this and kind of really found my voice and started um, testifying before Congress and the house and just trying to get these laws passed. Um, and then just started sharing my story. People would hear, oh, my, because there's like, we don't believe this because we've never heard a survivor speak in America, you know. And it was like, well, gosh, I need to change that. And so really just, you know, God helped me find my voice uh, and started sharing anywhere and everywhere. I kind of made a deal with God. I said, you know, if you bring an opportunity to me to share my story, I will do it. I promise that I will do it. And please help me like be able to financially afford to do this um, because I'm a single mom. And eventually I had to quit my job because I was taking off so much vacation time because the request <laughs> coming in. I'm like, I got to quit because I um, ran out of vacation time, but I promised God I would do this, you know. So but he always provided. So. I was going to say, that's going to be a dangerous thing. Exactly. Uh, Giving God free range. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, That's scary. Uh, My kids were scared, too. They're like, Mom, you know, how are we going to be able to go to, you know, to baseball and all this stuff? So, yeah, it was scary. But I did have complete trust that, you know, since he helped me get out of that, like I lived through that. Mm -hmm. Um, And um and had a, you know, nice life. So it's like, I, I wanted to do it for all the others that weren't as lucky as I was, weren't as blessed. So, yeah. yeah. So as I'm starting to speak around the country and everything, I'm, I'm talking to audiences and especially the men are getting really mad. They're like, Oh my gosh, I haven't, I've, I've never heard anything about this. Like, I can't believe this. What can I do? And really other than 
pray or donate money to organizations, I had no answer. I, I'm like, don't go to strip clubs. Don't objectify women, you know, no. teach your sons about this, but I don't know. And, um, I was going to a talk in Michigan one night and I got lost going home and I started to see all the signs of the towns that I had used to been taken to. Oh. And I lost it. I absolutely lost it. I mean, I had that ugly cry, the snot out of your nose. And I'm like, God, why are you doing this to me? And I'm like, I have promised to be your servant. And now, like, really? I come back to Michigan to do this and this happens. And I was angry. And it was at that moment. That was like a pivotal moment. I saw a vision of a young girl laying in a motel like I had been. And I thought, wow, there's still so many Teresa's out there. Mm. And we have people that want to go and find them and help. How do I, how do I put this together? And he showed me on my drive home that night, um, a way to do that. And that was to really mobilize communities to help get that phone number. We have a hotline and I think Canada has a hotline too. Um, and to really plaster the whole country with this hotline, um, and look for these missing girls. Cause if my parents would have, checked my bed at two in the morning, come in my room, they would have seen I wasn't there, you know? And so a lot of these girls are missing and runaways and boys too. And I thought, you know, I can get people to help me and we can do something. So that's how it was born. So what are some of those things that you are doing to get that phone number out? So um, we go to lo- usually big sporting events, but we also have local mm-hmm. chapters around the U.S. that um, continue doing this, like even on a monthly basis. Uh, we get people to label bars of soap with the national hotline on it, and we give it to hotels for free to put in the bathrooms. And we also give them educational materials on what are the signs of human trafficking. And then we give them missing children's posters because a lot of these boys and girls are missing and runaways. And so we uh, ask them if just to post that and if they see somebody to call. So kind of a see something, say something. Mm-hmm. So it, it is called the Soap Project. How did you come up with the name? <laughs> that was on that same trip, actually. <laughs> As I'm, you know, wiping the, you know, my nose and crying, I was like, God gave me this idea, and I was just like, okay, that's great, you know. But like, I'm really busy right now, and I, when I have some time, uh, you know, that's it's great. I can do that, God. And <clears throat> and you know what? Like when he gets a hold of you, he is not gonna let go, and and so. You know, halfway home, I was like, man, this is really, I can really do this. But what would I call it? So I decided I'm going to challenge him. Mm. You know, like, if, if this is really like just not my mind making this up and this is divinely inspired, like, what would I, what would it be called? And kind of like, prove it to me, God, you know, yeah. <laughs> put, uh, put the fleece out there. As a... <laughs> and <laughs> it was did. like the radio was on full blast and, and it, and I hear soap and I was like, that's stupid. Like putting a <laughs> number on a bar of soap, like, duh. And then I decided to challenge him even more. And I'm like, if this is something you really want me to do, what would soap stand for? Cause a mm. lot of our organizations have little acronyms, right? We have like women at risk. They're called war, you know, all these different ones. Um, and so, yeah, it popped into my head, save our adolescents from prostitution. And it was just like, boom, like that. And I was like, there is no way I could have done that on my own without even a two days of board meetings. Like th- that's okay. Like, you, you sold me God. And so, so um, when I got home the next day, it was that we was full speed ahead. Wow. And so did you, you had the idea then, like you were going to do the bars of soap. You were going to huh? put like that all just came to you. Why, why soap? Why not pump soap? And you could put it under, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> throwing right. out ideas here. Yeah. Yeah. No, it really, truly just came to me like that. Um, But it did make sense when I started to break it down, like, you know, what? So I was thinking like every hotel motel, no matter how nice and how skanky has to have a bar of soap because of board of health regulations. I didn't know this, but it just kind of came to me. The only three things that are similar in every hotel is they all have soap, they all have toilet paper, um, and they all have a Bible. And I wasn't reading the Bible back then. And so it was like, 
Sometimes towels are extra. Sometimes oh. shampoo doesn't come. I mean, really, truly, those are the only three things they all have. So I'm like, and she gets to go into, or he gets to go into the bathroom after each man who buys them and and clean up for a few minutes alone. And so I'm like, that's her alone moment. So mm-hmm. this, this is it. So it was really, truly like divinely inspired. Wow. I just, it's amazing that just in our lifetime, really, there's now been language and names mm-hmm attached to what's happening and how rampant it is. Um, I mean, this is the Why Me Project, so I want to dive into that Why Me moment because I am so curious as to what that was for you and where did it lead you to? I think, you know, the Why Me, we we always ask that, and you know, in our life. I think everybody asks that in some, <clears throat> at some point in their life, right? You know, mm-hmm. why did my car break down? Why, you know, why did all these things... And I I have so many why me moments, Um, but I don't think I never, I never questioned why me for this, for this ministry. Hmm. Hmm. I, I surely questioned why me for being trafficked, right? Yeah. Like, you know, did they know ahead of time? How did they pick me out? Was it intentional? Was it just a fluke? Like, why? as a good girl with good parents and, you know, family, like, why did that happen to me? You know, and you would have thought, you know, inner city poverty, you know, abusive family, like I had none of that applied to me. Um, But once it was revealed to me, my past, it all made sense. So, yeah. So the why, the why me, as far as like every day, in my and getting up and doing this work, I never asked that because I know why. Because he had that plan. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I'm, I'm curious. Do you ever wish that it it wasn't your calling to go down that road, or um, are, you at, are you at peace with like I went through that and now I'm making a huge difference because it is such a problem. It, it that's the the latter. Yes, every mm. day I thank God for letting me do this work. And, um, sure it's hard. Like I, you know, had my daughter's bridal shower one day and then the next day, the day before I'm stuck in Chicago because I, the weather and, you know, there's like, oh, come on. Like just, you know, I'm doing this work, like cut me some slack here, you know? So it's, it is very difficult. Um, and not just the traveling and speaking in front of strangers about something that's really personal, right? Mm. Um, But it's, I meet others that have gone through it. And that's the hard part is Mm -hmm. seeing all these others that this has happened to. Um, I mean, I probably ask more like, why is this happening, God, than why, why me or why her or how I him. But um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's definitely a very, very hard job, um, but it, it comes with a lot of rewards. Yeah. I think the one of the last questions that I want to ask is probably what a lot of people who are listening are going to say the same thing. How can I get involved? What can I do? What can we do in order to uh, help your your organization, help your ministry, or just get the word out? Yeah. Um. Th- you know, now I know there's lots of things people can do. <laughs> um. They can go to our website, which is soapproject.org. Um, you know, we run clearly on donations only, no, no grants or anything like that. So, um, however people bless us is how we keep going. Uh, we do also besides the soap project, we do wellness weekends for male and female survivors to help them in their healing process. Hmm. And so those, we, those cost us a lot of money because we fly them here. We, like, we do everything as, you know, we were trying to remove every barrier for them to get their healing. And so those are another aspect of uh, kind of really neat things that we do. Um, people can read my book. It's on Amazon. Um, I think it's on our website too. And they can read my full story. My, the newest one, my 10th year anniversary talks about People know my story um, and they know what I do now, but they don't know those middle years of how God helped me get to where I am now, my journey. And so that that's a great book. Um, we also have a youth book for middle and high school students on what is human trafficking. I mean, awareness is the best educator out there. And so um, so that's called slavery in the land of the free. Um, but 
I mean, you know, people can join a chapter. They can start a chapter. So if they're in a, a town and that those are on our website as well, if they're in an area that there isn't one, you know, I will come there and train you and teach you how to do this. And we can just swamp your area because really, like I said, besides awareness, like we need to get boots on the ground. Um, there's just really not enough law enforcement to, to really put a dent in this. So going after and finding these missing kids is a huge start. Um, we're going next week. Uh, actually, this weekend, I'll be in Mississippi doing a soap outreach. And the week after that, I'll be in Las Vegas getting wow. ready for our Super Bowl. So um, so we go all over and just plaster the whole country. Um, but even more so, if people think that they see something like if they have that feeling like this just situation does not look normal say something please just say something find somebody to talk to about it because i don't care if you're wrong you know people like second guess are like well maybe it's this or maybe it's that or maybe it's not this situation but what if you what if you were right and you didn't do anything you know it's my favorite parable is when you the shepherd has a hundred sheep mm. and one is missing, right? And the mm. question is, will he, will he leave 99 to go looking for that one? I can tell you I was that one. Mm. There, are, there are so many. And we don't think anybody's coming looking for us. So that's what I love about the Soap Project is that we are looking for them. Like we're the shepherds looking for that one sheep. And it's a beautiful moment when we can find it. Mm-hmm. And we, we had that discussion a few years ago with somebody that we were talking to on, on the show about Super Bowl and just uh-huh. how it, one of the biggest human yeah. traffic days there is, especially in the city that it is. And it just so happens Vegas this year, which is yeah. even worse. You can, you know, add that on top of everything else. And it's just, uh, there's, there's a lot of advocacy like yourself that needs to be feet on the ground for yeah. the week leading up to that. And, you know, prayer, prayer too, you know, is really important because we're fighting evil. Yeah. Like this is evil. I know when I, when I do these outreaches, I pray, I pray for protection around my team, around their families, um, because it is really tough and we get attacked all the time. Um, the week that the weekend that we're doing the soap outreach, because we always go a week before or two before the actual event. So in two weeks, when we go to Vegas to do the outreach and go to every hotel that's like, you know, medium to small size, the adult porn expo is going to be that weekend. Hmm. Like, oh my gosh, God, like this was amazing that this cord, this like fell on the exact weekend. We know traffickers are going to be bringing girls and boys in by the bus load for that porn expo and then stay in for the Super Bowl. So, you know, we have an opportunity to really, really make a difference. Um, but we're up against a lot of evil too. Yeah. I, I have one more question just about the faith component of it because yeah. it would be so easy just to, I think, depending where you are in your faith journey to think, God, okay, this is happening. Where are you in this? Mm-hmm. Um, kind of taking a look at your life and, and your journey. How has the situation you've gone through made your faith actually stronger? Oh, gosh. You know, I always say that, you know, we, we hear him, right? And, and we hear him. And listening is good, but the hardest part is saying yes. And obeying, right? And yeah. so I think that's definitely made me stronger is I can hear him clear now. And um I know to say yes, even if there's times that I don't want to, you know. <laughs> um, it's made me definitely stronger in that. Um I can see the brokenness in the other survivors who don't have this beautiful thing called faith. Um, they tend not to give themselves grace or others. And um And it's hard because so many of the anti-human trafficking organizations are faith-based, but you can't like make somebody believe you can just show by example. And Mm. that's what we try to do at our retreats. So I would not be here um, and be this strong if it weren't for my faith. Soapproject.org at the underscore soap underscore project on the socials. Uh, she's a terrible golfer, but a great <laughs> golf cart driver. 
<laughs> Teresa, thank you so very much for taking some time and sharing your heart. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you all much, so much for giving my voice a platform. Well, you have one of two choices. You can either do something about it or you could bury your head in the sand and pretend like none of this is going on. And Teresa chose the latter. And it's uh, amazing the work that she is doing and continues to do. Yeah, absolutely. It's phenomenal how this particular season in her life, two years really just changed the trajectory of her life. And I am so grateful that she is taking a stand and doing something about it. And also two years of her being mid-teens and going through all things that teens are going through and then having to deal with all of this stuff. And it's just, I I can't imagine. And it seems as though every six months to a year, we have a guest on who has been involved in this somehow, some way. And it's just a reminder for us that we need to make sure we get all the education we can. And if you see something, say something. Yeah, I love that she said that. If you see something, say something. I mean, her story heartbreaking, but yet her story is not a unique story. That's the wild thing about it. Um, And so it's happening now. It's happening today. And definitely prayer, 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 prayer and education. Yeah, there's uh, ways for you to get involved. I would encourage you to do so. Uh, by the way, like and subscribe on all of our socials and that follow us. If you have questions, we can also send you uh, different links and stuff to her or maybe there's other organizations that are doing amazing things that uh, you can get involved with. Absolutely. So please do so whether you find us on Facebook, Instagram, no. YouTube. No. Um, what am I missing? Uh, X. Yes, we're there yep. too. Um, but of course, you can always check out more information about Why Me Project at faithstrongtoday.com. Yeah.